Hello, gardeners, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week. This is the place you can come to get your gardening questions answered, hang out with other gardeners as we share information, and just have a little bit of fun on Monday. Let's go ahead and start with a question that Hiroko Hill is asking. And as you check in, by all means, let me know where you're from, what you're doing, what your questions are. Hiroko's from Spokane and wondering how to deal with the earwigs in the garden. And this is one of those issues that a lot of it is environmental. If you set up the conditions that earwigs like, then you might have an earwig problem. If you take away those conditions, it lessens the problem. So they like to live, they like to nest in really moist environments. So if you're using wood chips, for instance, as a mulch or any other deep mulch, and the mulch is staying continually moist, well, those are ideal conditions for earwigs. So try to find out where the earwigs might be coming from, where their nest is, and if you can disrupt that nest and dry it out, then right away you're gonna be controlling some of the earwigs. Now, you can use boric acid and you can use rubbing alcohol and water sprays. You can bury tuna cans and make little traps. One of the things that I find if you have the earwigs and you don't know where their nest is, is to just take rolled up newspaper, four or five sheets of newspaper, wet it, put it in a roll. You can do the same thing with cardboard. Put cardboard in your pathway, get it nice and wet. And again, because those are the conditions that the earwigs like, they're probably going to find that rolled up wet newspaper or that wet cardboard, and then they're going to group underneath it. So you can set the traps, you can try getting rid of them as they get to the close to the plant, but if you can get them in large numbers, I find that to be the best and most effective way to do it. So I've, I've had it a few times, the problems with earwigs, and the rolled up newspaper really worked well for me because I could go out in the morning, find a bunch of earwigs in the newspaper, and then just fold it up and throw it in the trash and dozens of earwigs would be dealt with. The best thing overall is to build a healthy environment in your garden that encourages predatory insects, predatory wasps, and birds, because birds are gonna eat a lot of those earwigs as well. So try to find the nest, lay some traps, encourage birds, and that's a good way to try to get rid of some of the earwig problems you might have. So lots of people checking in, good to see you back, Prepper Chris, Daryl, Janet, Jennifer, Doris, Patricio, Laura Full, Frank, Vanessa. Well, we got people checking in from all over the place, and this is just incredible. <clears throat> Brian's asking, first year growing bush limas. Any tips on harvesting? Some beans are green and others have dried and turned brown. Um, I would say try to get them before they turn brown. So as a first year gardener in particular, and this holds true for all of us, Pay close attention to your plants, and especially with beans, you'll notice a progression, and this comes with experience. Go ahead and pull off pods when they're green, and then eat them. Eat the whole pod, eat the bean, and see what you think about the taste and the texture. And then let some more of the pods develop for another week, and then you harvest some of those. And you may notice some color changes. Like if the pod changes from green to yellow, you're definitely going to notice a change in the taste because the pod is aging. And then if you wait too long, you're gonna find that the beans are drying and turning brown on the inside. So you just have to get out there and do it. You have to harvest at different stages so you find out which stage is best for you. Do look at the seed packets when you are putting in your beans or your peas or any of the pod vegetables, because there should be a picture that gives you an indication of what the mature pod looks like. And so I'm growing rattlesnake beans, for instance, which have a speckled pod with kind of a, a the, the pod is green and then there's a speckling of red and brown on it. Well, when I see that green with that speckling, I know that the beans are ready for harvest. So um, take a look at your seed packet to see what it should look like, and then just get out there and harvest and taste and see what you think. 
So the group captain is checking in from Louisiana. Good to see you here, brew captain. Tammy says good morning. Shannon's back from Canada. We have Lorna in Indiana, David, Utah, Peter, Wisconsin, Hawkeye, Texas 549. I think that TX is for Texas, but you say you're in Wickenburg, Arizona. I've been through Wickenburg. I actually like Arizona. I'm trying to think about maybe planning a trip to see my brother and sister-in-law and niece who live in Casa Grande, Arizona sometime in the winter months. So I um, haven't been to Arizona in about a year, but looking forward to going back. So great to see everybody check in. If you have any questions, by all means, throw them at me. For those of you who've been here a while, you know that I try to get to as many questions as I can from this week. A little bit later in the show today, I'll also be answering 15 questions from last week. And then I'll be throwing out just some general information that I think is appropriate for this time of year. I also am interested about what you're doing in your garden, what results you have. And I think that's really good, especially for those of you that have been here before. It can generate a lot of really good discussion. And so I saw some of the earlier discussion about harvesting zucchini plants. And a question was raised about what you're doing with your zucchinis. But I didn't see a response. So I'll go ahead and tell you what I'm doing with my zucchinis. Because I've started harvesting over the last couple weeks. I had a wonderful grilled zucchini last week. That's one of my favorite ways to do it. You slice the zucchini um, vertically. So it's long slices. And then you put a little bit of olive oil on them, and then you put them on the grill, and a little salt, and a little pepper, and that's it. It's incredible. So if you've never had zucchini that way, definitely do it. I also like to put it in slices or maybe cubes with some onion and garlic sautéed in olive oil. Also incredible. And then I'll have my zucchini raw in salads. In, uh, just like you might use uh, cucumber in a salad, I do the same with my zucchini. So share those kind of things with the rest of the group. If you're doing something special or you discovered something about your harvest or what you're doing or how you're using your harvest, by all means share it because I think we can all benefit, especially the new people that are just checking in for the first time or maybe just gardening for the first year. There's so much great information with all of you on the Gardener's God channel community live stream today. Nina, thank you so much for that contribution. That super chat is wonderful. So uh, it's helping to make a wonderful morning for me and I do appreciate you offering that super chat. Thank you so much. Carlos is asking, do you harden your seedlings any different for fall? Um, yes, a little bit different. So when I have seedlings that I'm growing to put into a fall garden, one of the things that's different is the temperature. So when I harden off seedlings in the spring to put out into the garden, it's usually cool temperatures. So I'm hardening the plants off to go from a warm indoor environment into a cool environment, particularly the overnight cold temperatures. That's why I'm hardening off in the spring. But in the summer, the plants are going from a nice warm environment outside to a warm environment. So the hardening off doesn't need to be as long, but the key here is the sun. So when you harden off going from summer or into the fall garden planting, you have to be careful that you don't take the seedlings that you have in a nice protected indoor location and then stick them right out into full sunlight. So whereas in the spring, I'm getting them used to the cool conditions initially, in the summer, I'm getting them used to the harsh sun. So the difference is when you harden off seedlings at this time of year, you put them outside in the sun for an hour or two and then move them into the shade. And you can leave them outside overnight because the conditions should be warm enough. You don't necessarily have to bring them inside like you would a spring hardening off. But each day, usually only takes maybe three or four days, expose them to more and more sunlight and the heat, and then you can put them in your garden. So a little bit different, same basic concept. Hope that helps. Prepper Chris, thank you again for that super chat. Um, it's becoming a nice tradition. 
just for being you. You're awesome. You got a small echo. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, that happens every now and then, and I don't know why. So let's see if maybe it moderates a little bit over the next couple minutes. I think I'll have to invest in, in a new and different microphone. So Skippy, hey, back to you. Hope everyone is well. I'm doing well. I've had a great gardening week. I'm looking forward to this next week as well. We're having unusually high temperatures on a regular basis. It's not unusual for me to get hot summertime temperatures, but this next week we're going to be above average every single day. So I'm not looking forward to that because it cuts down on how much I want to get done in the garden. But um, other than that, doing well. I'm still putting some plants in, still putting some seeds in. Hopefully you've been following along as I've been doing all of the fall planting or fall garden videos with the summer planting because I'm trying to show you exactly what I do as I do it to give you some tips along the way. Okay, um, let's see, Patrick is saying, do you think gardening has been a refuge for many people in this time? Absolutely. And I've had a lot of people reach out to me over the last few months uh, saying exactly that. Gardening is a refuge. Gardening is an encouragement in their life. Gardening is a way to escape from some of the things that have been happening in the last couple of months. So yes, I think gardening is wonderful all the time, and that's why I've been doing it for, for decades, because it gives me a lot of internal peace and it just is a nice place to be. But especially during these times, I think gardening has helped a lot of people, and, and I'm glad that I've been able to be there to help a lot of people with my videos to get people interested in gardening and to get gardeners to become better at gardening. You know that. That's my mission here. So um, keep doing that. I encourage that you do the same thing. Because I've seen that gardening has helped a lot of people this summer, do what you can do to play your role to get others interested in gardening, to get others um, involved. You can share your stories, and that might be enough to motivate somebody to start gardening. So I can do it. You can do it too. So thank you for that question. Yes, I think gardening is very important for a lot of people all the time. Uh, Preppers, Chris is back. It's looking like La Nina hot in the West. Yeah, we have a... a um, high pressure system that's set up over Arizona right now into New Mexico and is just pumping the hot temperatures in and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. We had a little bit of monsoonal flow um, week before last, but but it's setting up. It's going to be hot. It's going to be interesting to see what this winter is going to bring. Uh, I am planning. It's interesting you mentioned La Nina. I'm planning a video later in the, this winter when I'm not outside and I'm doing inside videos to talk a little bit about La Nina and um, um, La Nino uh, and how they actually affect weather patterns and how that influences gardeners. So um, kind of interesting that the whole the whole process of the the uh, La Nino and La Nina is is really pretty fascinating and this is again gets back to just learning more about your region and about gardening because if you can understand your weather patterns and what affects your weather patterns then it can have a huge impact on how you garden and more importantly your success with gardening because so many gardeners try to grow things that just don't stand a chance because they don't understand their region, their climate, their weather patterns. But if you can start to understand the differences between your region and another one, you can probably have greater success. And that's why I say, listen to lots of experts. Watch lots of videos, read lots of books, because I'll show you how I do things in my garden and I'll give you recommendations of how you could do it in your garden but there's a lot of other people out there that might have information more suitable for your area. And just don't blindly follow someone's advice because all of our gardens are different. Definitely learn about your weather patterns. Um, Patricio, thank you for that sticker. The super sticker is cool. Uh, nice exercising bird. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Um, let's see what else we have. Yeah, Prepper Chris is saying weather is so important for growing um, and for living. So it's it's in, it's incredible how much we are impacted by weather, but yet we don't stop and actually think about how we can uh, change that impact, particularly talking about the garden. Okay, Mrs. Marvel, thanks. Um, such a good point. Last year felt much wetter sooner than this year. We're still waiting for monsoon rains. And, you know, this gets back to the concept of garden journals as well. You've, if you've heard me um, in earlier live streams or on some of my videos, you know that I encourage gardening journals. Well, some of the better gardening journals actually have sections where you can track the weather on a daily basis. And if you start seeing some of these patterns, because we do have changing seasons, every year seems to be a little bit different, but there are some similarities. Start marking it down in your garden journal for next year and the year after. And that's another great way that you can keep your garden right in tune with nature. And again, have that success. Nina, thank you for that super chat. Have you heard of using chicken feed or rabbit feed as a soil amendment? It seems to have lots of the right nutrients and is cheap. Yes, absolutely. So many of the pellets that are used for rabbits and chickens, um, for example, one of the prime ingredients is alfalfa. And so you'll see alfalfa pellets, especially for rabbits. Alfalfa is a wonderful soil amendment. And at the Galileo Garden at the school, I was actually growing alfalfa to use in the compost pot just because it's, it's pretty nutrient rich. And so by using the pellets or the feed as a, a soil amendment, you're getting all of those same nutrients. And it's not just alfalfa, that tends to be a primary one, but almost all of them are vegetative in their composition. They have some type of plant that makes up the chicken feed and the rabbit feed. The rabbit or the, the chicken might be more corn based, uh, but absolutely it can be a very cost effective way to amend your soil. Don't uh, bypass the opportunity though of giving the feed to your chickens and rabbits and then using the manure in the garden, usually through composting because they're taking the nutrient rich feed and pellets and then converting it into a product that's already been digested and still has nutrients in it. So either way, yeah, use the raw feed as a soil amendment. Definitely consider using the manure, all very good ideas and can be quite cost effective if you, if you buy it in bulk, like at a ranch supply store. So um, uh, interesting question, good idea. I encourage that you do it. Hawkeye is saying, do you have any experience in wicking beds? I'm seeing this being done more and more. Yeah, I think I talked a little bit about wicking beds last week. Um, they can be very effective, and I think they're most effective in regions that have pretty consistent weather. So you don't have a lot of variability. Now, I've tried some smaller wicking beds here in Colorado. They haven't worked well for me, but that's primarily because our humidity, this last week it's been around 8%, it's very, very dry. And we have very windy conditions. And it's very, very hot, as I already said, above normal. And so the way a wicking bed works is in the bottom is a reservoir of some type. And so when you water, the water goes into the reservoir, and then through capillary action, the water warms the soil or what other, whatever medium you might have above it, like maybe um, peat moss. And the idea is that the water gradually works its way up to keep the soil evenly moist. That's the concept, and it can work that way. But for me, in my region, what happens is because of the high heat and the winds and the low humidity, the top of the soil dries out very quickly. And that capillary action, the water moving from below to the surface, just isn't that effective. And so for it to work, for it to balance, what ends up happening is the lower part of the soil has to be wet for the top to be moist. 
And so now when the roots are growing, they're growing into a really soggy soil environment, more chance for root rot, and the top of the soil is still drying out. So when I did wicking beds, I found that I had to still hand water the surface to keep the soil from drying out even deeper. And then I thought, well, if I'm watering the surface, why am I even trying a wicking bed, a wicking bed at all? So I really don't do much in the way of wicking beds anymore. Do look into it more because it can be effective if you don't have those harsh weather extremes like I do. Joseph, thank you for that super chat. Hello to you uh, from Texas. I'm also planning to see Texas. On that same trip to Arizona, I'm going to try to swing through Texas on my way to Louisiana, which is where my son and his family are. Hope you're doing well. Thank you for your knowledge. Um, yes, thank you. I appreciate that contribution. I am doing well. It's been a good week. Got a lot done in the garden this week. I'm looking forward to getting a lot more done in the garden this next week. Um, if you're a gardener and you're in the garden, almost by definition, you're doing well. So uh, thank you for asking that. I hope you're doing well and I hope you're getting out in the garden. Diane is saying, Gardener Scott, wondering if I should compost my tomato and pepper plants. Came back from vacation and they were eaten again from something that burrowed under the bed this time. Um, <clears throat> sorry to hear that. Uh, as you may have noticed in some of my videos, I have uh, either hardware cloth or chicken wire under my bed so that I don't have anything burrowing in. I've got a gopher problem and a vole problem. But uh, yeah, you can definitely compost your tomato and your pepper plants. And, and I talked about this a few weeks back as well. I don't compost tomato plants that are diseased because I don't have a hot compost pile. And unless you get your compost well above 140 degrees, you're not gonna kill any of the pathogens. But if your tomato plants and your pepper plants are healthy with no sign of pests and disease other than that they've been eaten, yeah, by all means, throw them into the compost. That's a good way to, to recycle all of that material back into your garden when you use the compost. Okay, Leticia is saying, first year gardening here. Have tomatoes and jalapenos in containers. Started July 3rd, decided to buy two green stock systems after seeing your video, and we'll plant one for late summer and one for fall. Awesome, that is awesome, incredible. To do all that in the first year, I'm impressed. Um, I hope that the, the um, green stock systems work well for you. I've, I've still added some more. If you saw the video I released last night, I showed the green stock container, talking about doing some fall gardening in it. Um, by all means, if you haven't done a green stock, consider it. Uh, you can actually look in the description. I think it should be in this live stream, and it's definitely in my videos. If, if you're considering the green stock vertical gardening system, do use the code Gardener Scott because it'll give you a 10% discount. They're, they're not cheap, they're not overly expensive, but if you can save $10 by using the Gardener Scott code, um, I think it's the least you can do to save yourself a few bucks. It's, it's an interesting system, and I've actually um, enjoyed it this year. This is the first year I've used the green stock. To do green stock, two green stock systems, um, that's, that's incredible. You're doubling your, your output and I'll try to do more videos where I show using it more. The big suggestion that I have right now that was in last night's video is a system like the green stock may not be real easy to move in and out of like a garage or a shed as the, as the temperatures get cooler. But if you move it right up next, next to your house, your house is pretty warm. And when there's cool air outside, your house is definitely going to be warmer than the cool air, especially as we move into the fall. So move your green stock tower garden close to your house, like right next to it when the nights start getting cool and your house will help warm the, the soil and keep those plants growing a couple extra weeks maybe before they start really suffering from extra cold condition if you have a winter where the temperatures get cold. Okay, Kyle is saying, good morning, and good morning back to you. I started my first raised bed after watching your videos to much success, but the cukes have overrun my trellis. If I cut off the main growing tip, will I no longer get new fruit? Yeah, pretty much. Um, 
the way the cucumbers grow is at that junction, as you probably noticed, between the main stem and the leaves, you'll get the fruit and you'll get a tendril and you'll get more leaves and it'll keep growing and at each new junction you'll get new fruit, new leaves. Um, and if you cut off that tip, that process starts. Consider, depending on how big your trellis is, consider start growing sideways once the cucumbers get to the top of the trellis. You can actually train the vine to, grow, to go horizontally or you can allow it to drop down on the outside of the trellis. So I've done that before too, where it'll grow up the trellis, continue to fruit, and then I'll let it grow over the trellis and flop down to the side. Or if I've got support on the side, I'll let it go horizontal. So try to delay cutting the tip off for as long as possible because that will stop that, that further fruit production on that stem. But it, you can continue training the vine in all different directions. So think about doing that experiment a little bit and try to extend that vine's fruit production as long as you can. It's kind of fun. Laura, thank you for that super chat contribution. Would small sifted wood chips be good for a mixed material compost pile if kept moist and turned frequently? How would you recommend doing this? Yes, um, and, and I actually do this. I've been adding... Um, some small wood chips sifted and I've actually been adding some small dried leaves to my compost pile a little more than I have in the past. <clears throat> and the reason I do it, and I've talked about this in um, my composting video and I talked about it in some other videos as well. So for the most part a compost pile is decomposed by bacteria. Wood is decomposed primarily by fungi. And so if you have a typical compost pile and then you amend your soil with it, then you are creating a bacterial rich soil. But if you can incorporate some of that fungi, it makes for a much better soil overall. So yes, I do recommend adding some sifted wood chips into your pile. Now they're going to take longer to break down. And because it's fungi that's breaking down those wood chips, you need to make sure that your pile is staying evenly moist, especially around the edges. You know, my pile, my dry air, I try to water my compost pile every other day or so and the outside always dries out. Well, if you're gonna put wood in your pile, you really need to try to keep it moist or else the fungi is going to die. The bacteria is a little more resilient, but the fungi is, will die in dry conditions. So. At probably add more water than you're used to to keep the pile moist. If it starts smelling, then you've added too much water. You might also need to add some extra nitrogen because that wood's going to require more nitrogen to break down. So add more greens. The wood chips are kind of a um, super carbon, so to speak. So it's gonna take more nitrogen for them to break down. So increase the amount of greens in your pile increase the amount of water that you might normally have in your pile, and definitely consider using some sifted wood chips. Okay, uh, Benicios Pessoa is asking, what do you do to protect your plants from pests? Uh, that's a good question. And um, again, look back. Um, if you're new to the live stream, I encourage you, look back to earlier live streams because there's a lot of questions that I answer in earlier live streams. I've talked a lot about pests over um, the last couple of months in the live stream. So there's some answers there. I do a lot of different things about pests. One of the things I'm doing right now, and you might see this in my most recent videos, with the fall garden, I'm actually covering some of the seedling beds with row cover. And this is typical in spring. I also do it in the summer. So if you put a row cover fabric over hoops over your plants, that will keep some of the pests away from those young seedlings. And those are the, the, the pests that will typically eat a seedling. But generally, except for those kind of covers in the spring and the fall, what I do is create a healthy growing environment. Like I said earlier with the earwigs, if you 
plant a lot of flowers and a lot of grasses and let some of the weeds grow around the edges. That encourages a lot of beneficial insects. And I let the beneficial insects take care of the pests for the most part. <coughs> Excuse me. I also encourage birds. <coughs> Sorry about that. So birds and beneficial insects will take care of those pests. And that's really the primary thing I do in my garden. I don't spray pesticides. I don't use any type of kitchen concoction. I just let nature take care of it. And I encourage nature. Okay. TD is saying, pumpkins, can you pick male stamen and save to use when the female flower opens? Um, good question. I was actually asked this question. I had the video, um, Friday's video, I think it was, about hand pollination. And I show how you can <coughs> pluck off a male pumpkin flower to fertilize the female pumpkin flower. The thing about pollen is that it has a very short life span. It's actually alive. And so you have to keep it living for it to be effective. So you really can't pick a male flower and then save it for a female flower, flower because that male pollen will die in very little time. So I only pick off the male flower when I'm planning to fertilize a female flower right away. Um, there's really not much you can do unless you're in a laboratory setting to keep the pollen viable. So no, um, don't, don't think that you can save it for any time. Now you can use a single male flower to pollinate multiple female flowers because there's a lot of pollen on that male stamen. So if you've got a lot of female flowers, maybe the male flowers have actually started to dissipate and that's why you have this concern, use a single male flower on multiple female flowers if you have that option. Um, but once you've picked it and once you've used it, go ahead and throw it into the compost pile or throw it onto the bed as, as a, a mulch so it'll decompose. You really can't save it. Carla, there you are with your cat and your super chat contribution. Thank you so much. You make my week every week. Thank you for the gardening information and encouragement. And as you know, it's my pleasure. Annabelle is saying, hi, Mr. Scott, I'm filling up a raised bed. What should be the percentages of the different parts that I should use? Thank you. Greetings from Chile. Um, and thank you for that super chat. That's a, that's a really good question. And um, sadly, because there's so much involved to it, it takes a long time to answer. But I'll give you some basic ideas, okay? And, and if you haven't seen my video about soil, I encourage that you watch it because I talk about the percentages of a good soil in my video about soil. And I also mention it in a few other videos where I'm talking about the soil in a raised bed. So basically, when you are creating a soil, it should have a blend. About 50% of it should be mineral based. And by mineral, we're basically talking your native soil. So when you're creating your soil, you should, or your soil for your raised beds, at least half of it initially should be your native soil. And then you start getting into the other parts of soil, which believe it or not is like 25% oxygen or air, 25% water. So the idea being that soil is basically a lot of air, a lot of water, and a lot of the minerals from your, your area. And it's only about 5% of a good soil that is organic. And so I always encourage that you add organic material to your soil, but it doesn't need to be huge amounts. And so to get that 5% mineral or 5% organic component in your soil, I recommend that you start with a 25% mixture because if you have 
let's say three cubic feet of soil, then you add one cubic feet of organic material, and that's going to decompose, and eventually you'll reach that, that permanent and consistent 5% organic material in your soil. But because it's going to break down, you need to start with more than 5%. So in my beds, when I'm, I'm starting them, I'm building them, I'll, I'll have a big soil component, native soil, and let's say it's six or seven inches of soil deep, and then on top of that, I'll add two inches, or maybe three inches of compost, of dried grass, of manure, and then I mix it all up. So when starting a bed, about 25% is really a good target. When I buy my soil in bulk, I'm buying soil that has 30% organic material mixed into it. Well, that decomposes pretty quickly as I uh, keep the beds wet and as the plants use those nutrients. And then I have to keep adding more organic material every year. And what I do is continue to add two to three inches of compost and work it into the soil. When you get to that point where you have a loose, rich soil that has that organic material in part of, in, in it as part of it, then you can just start adding mulches, organic mulches on top after that, and hopefully reach a no-dig garden bed system where what you're adding on top replenishes everything below. But in the beginning, when you're starting a bed, when you're building your soil, it's going to take some years, um, three to five years of every season adding organic material, aiming for that two to three inches or maybe 25% of your volume, and then just keep amending. Just keep trying to build your soil, and eventually you'll get to that point where it's kind of an equilibrium and the mulch is enough like Charles Dowding does to just throw some compost and mulch on the top, and then the, the soil, organi soil organisms take care of it from that point forward. So, um, got other videos that talk more about this, how to fill the raised bed, how, how to make the compost, the understanding soil, those are all videos that are in my library that I encourage you to check out. Um, okay, let's talk a, a real quick about um, a couple questions I had last week. Um, Nicole M. and M.B. Gardner had both asked similar questions. So Nicole had said, should I stake my zucchini plants and could I be overwatering them? I've gotten a few full-grown vegetables, but I find some will rot off before they are full-grown. And then M.B. Gardner said, do you prune your squash? And if so, how? Is it okay to have squash leaves turning blotchy yellow? Okay, so if you're overwatering your squashes, Chances are the leaves are probably going to start turning yellow and the fruit might get um, a blossom end rot. You'll see it really dark on the flower end of the fruit and fall off. So those are both indications that you're overwatering, And so <clears throat> cut back on your water if, if you see those kind of indications. As for pruning, yes, by all means, you can prune your zucchini, you can prune your squashes. I have a video coming out uh, later this week that'll show a little bit of pruning because you can actually grow your squash plants vertically and that all has to deal with how you prune. Do realize that you need to keep leaves on your plants. So you don't want to prune off a lot of leaves because that's where the photosynthesis happens and that's where the energy goes to your fruit. So if you prune too many leaves off, you're also probably going to see some of the fruit fall off because the plant just doesn't have enough energy to support all of the plant. But if you prune some of those lower leaves as they get old, as they start to yellow, then now all the energy in the plant is going into new leaves and fruit production, and that helps keep the plant nice and healthy. Especially as the plant gets bigger and taller, you want to have the airflow throughout the plant and throughout all the plants. If you've got a lot of squash plants growing in a bed, you want a lot of airflow. And one of the problems that often happens is powdery mildew, and that's primarily caused because the air circulation is inadequate. So 
consider pruning your squash plants, consider pruning your zucchini to take off some of those lower leaves. If plants are growing into other plants, prune out some of those leaves so that you can increase the air circulation, but don't overdo it because it will affect your fruit. Okay, um, Laura Full saying, if we remove the flower before it falls off, <clears throat> it can dry the end better. Um, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Maybe you're asking somebody else. So um, go ahead and ask it again if, if it's directed at me. So Arcelius P is saying, can you use topsoil for building your raised beds? Um, yes, and that's what I'm saying when I say native soil. Now, I don't recommend that you go to one of the big box stores and buy a bag of topsoil. We've talked about this in weeks past where there's no guidance from any organization or, or any government entity about what topsoil should be. And there are so many horror stories out there of people who have bought bags of topsoil and it's filled with glass, it's got um, rusted cans, it's got rocks in it. I don't encourage you buy that type of topsoil. But you can often buy sifted topsoil, and I've done that before from one of our local stone companies, and that's good to use. Use your own topsoil in a raised bed. That will get you that 50% mineral component of a good soil. And then to that, you add all of the organic material. You keep it aerated so you get the oxygen and water into the soil, and that's a good way to go. Just do try to be aware of whether the topsoil is clay-based or sand-based, because I've seen that problem with people that are growing in a nice loamy area, they buy some topsoil and the topsoil is basically clay. And then they introduce clay into their garden beds and they make the situation worse. So try to figure out what kind of um, material the topsoil is, where it's coming from before you use it. But all, all, by all means, it, it is a, bio, all, a viable alternative. Um, so um, let's see, Steve is saying, had a rat eat one of the zucchini. That was a first. Um, interesting, yeah, I, I've never had a rat eat my zucchini. I did have uh, a squash once that had some teeth marks on it. I suspected it might have been a bowl, but um, that's, that's interesting. That's a first for me as well, to have rats eat your zucchini. I hope you'll find a way to control them, or at least harvest your zucchini before the rats get to them. Okay, um, let's see, Yaniris is checking in. Hello to you as well. Laura Full is saying, can removing the flower stuck to the end of the fruit, will it mitigate blossom end rot, or is it already too late? Um, th the blossom that's actually on the fruit has no impact whatsoever on whether you're going to have blossom end, root, end rot or not. So most instances that blossom is just gonna dry up and fall off. You can go ahead and remove it as soon as you see it. I harvested some squash last night and the blossom was still attached. I just pulled it off, threw it onto the soil and brought the, the squash inside. So the, the actual blossom has no impact on um, the blossom end rot, whether it's there or not. The blossom end rot is in most cases caused by an underwatering or an overwatering situation. Um, for many of us, it's overwatering, and that's what's going to cause the blossom end rot, not whether the flower is still attached or not. So do what you want with the flower, but do try to correct the watering if you notice some blossom end rot. And I actually, in my yellow squash, um, saw a couple of the young squash that were developing the blossom end rot because in our heat I've been watering twice a day and even me I can overwater my plants easily. So I overwatered because of the low humidity and the high heat and some of the developing squash was, was um, obviously uh, developing the blossom end rot. I encourage in that case it, you can still eat it. It's not going to harm the plant, but if you see the young squash or the young zucchini developing the blossom end rot, go ahead and cut them off and let the plant's energy go into the developing fruit that is full and can grow full size without a problem like that. 
So, um, Canix Ray U is horse manure okay to use in soil directly and in a compost pile is manure a good green? Um, no and yes. So horse manure, if it's well aged, can go into the soil directly. And I'm talking like six months to 12 months of aging before you put it into your soil. If you put it into your soil directly before that time, you do run the risk of some E. coli being introduced into the soil. It could also burn your plants. And why will it burn your plants? Because it's a really good source of nitrogen. And so the ammonium, that, the, <clears throat> that part of the, the transition of nitrogen into a source that the plants can use, the ammonium can be so strong that it will burn the roots and harm your plants. So if the manure is fresh, yes, it's a wonderful green component in compost because it's very rich in that nitrogen and ammonia component. component. So wonderful for compost, um, should be well composted or well aged before you put it into your soil. Thank you, that was a great question. Uh, Severin is saying, good morning from Ohio. Watching while I can my sixth batch of pickles of the year. That's great. I actually noticed yesterday that I think I've got enough pickles on my Boston pickling cucumbers to make some pickles. So after this, I'm going to go outside and harvest those pickles. I think I'm only, I only have enough for one or two jars, but I'm hoping to get my first batch of pickles for the year. So good for you, sixth batch. I think that's great. Um, I'm going to be doing fermented pickles this time. I normally do pickled pickles using vinegar, um, but this time I'm going to use a salt brine and ferment the pickles along with some of my fresh dill that I've been growing. So if you haven't done that yet, I have some videos on fermenting. I'll be doing more. If the, the fermented cucumbers turn out, I'm going to be filming it, of course. I'll release that video as well. So as you're harvesting, think about different ways that you can use your harvest. And pickles with your cucumbers is an ideal way to do it. So thank you for that, Severin, in um, sharing that because I think it's something a lot of other people should consider doing as well. Okay, so um, Bettina is saying you need to type at Gardner Scott for me to see your question. Um, thank you, Bettina, for, for mentioning that. And, and I, I, I try to mention that every other video or every other live stream or not. As you've seen, there are so many questions that are popping up, and I try to answer as many as I can. If you type in at, the at symbol, Gardner Scott, in your question, and it pops up on my screen, and I can see it a little bit easier when I do the quick glance and try to see what the questions are. Uh, especially if you've asked a question and you really want to try to get an answer to it, maybe it's time sensitive. If you ask, ask it two or three times, I may miss the question as it streams past two or three times. But if you put at Gardner Scott in your question, I'm more likely to see it. I may still not get to it, but I'm more likely to see it. Um, so Luz is saying at Gardner Scott, can you please do a video on your pickling process? Um, thank you. Yes, I am planning on filming it. Um, it's been a while since I've done it. The last time that I did fermented pickles, I wasn't as knowledgeable about it as I am now, and they didn't turn out real well. So if they turn out as I hope they do, then yes, definitely I'll release the video. <clears throat> I don't necessarily want to release a video when it doesn't turn out. But I've got the garlic that I recently harvested, I have the dill, and I have the pickles, and I'm planning on using those three in my process. And hopefully in a couple weeks, you'll get to see it. So thank you, Luz. Um, if it works out, you'll be seeing that video to come. Uh, Dot to Trots, Low Carb Living, is saying, when season ends, do I need to weatherize my raised bed? Is there something I should do for all the worms? Yes, and thank you for being concerned about your worms. Um, I was just thinking about this last night. Uh, I've got it programmed I think at the end of September. I, I program out my videos so I know what's coming and when I should start filming and how should I should put all the pieces together. And I think the end of September I have a video planned. 
haven't shot it yet, but it's about winterizing your beds for winter because you should do it. You should not leave bare soil going into the winter. You should not leave your beds exposed. So at a minimum, you should mulch your beds. Uh, and I do that with all my beds going into winter every year. Depending on how good your soil is, as I talked earlier, I will also amend my soil going into the winter. So I'll add compost, I'll add grass, I'll add dried leaves into my soil. And one of the main reasons for that is for the earthworms. Now, I've got lots and lots more worms going into my beds. I don't encourage that you get a shovel or a spade and start digging because you can really disrupt the structure of your soil and you can disrupt a lot of those earthworms. So I'll go in, I showed this in my um, um, fall planting or fall garden, planting a fall garden video last week where I'll take a garden fork and I'll just turn over the soil after I've put some of that organic material on top. So when I winterize a bed and the soil is poor, I'll add the compost and organic material. I'll just turn it upside down and then I'll cover all of that with an organic mulch. And uh, depending on where the bed is and what I'm planning to do with it the following year, I'll also plant a cover crop. And I have a video on green manures and cover crops that I did last year that talks a little bit about that. So I'll put in um, a, a rye or um, vetch. I like to use vetch or um, some type of winter pea. That's another way to winterize. So that video is coming. Look for it. <clears throat> but in the meantime, start thinking about your schedule and your planning to have organic material ready as you winterize your bed. Thank you for that question. Um, Dan H. is saying, is it necessary to crop, rotate, raised beds? Um, yes and no. <clears throat> it's not necessary if everything is going well. And so, for instance, my tomato bed this year, I'm planning on growing tomato bed or tomatoes in it next year. I'm planning on growing tomatoes in it the year after that. I will be amending the soil and improving it, adding more organic material. And as long as you're doing that, then you don't need to rotate your crops. You can keep growing the same plants in a bed every single year as long as you're replenishing the nutrients and adding more organic material. But if you find that you have a problem with a particular pest or disease, then you might want to think about rotating some of your crops. And so I know some of you have had issues with um, borers, like, like squash borers that are killing your plants. Well, they will overwinter in the soil. So if you have a problem with a squash borer, you might not want to put squash in that same bed the next year because it's possible that there are some eggs in that soil and when they hatch, when the larva emerges, it's looking for squash. If it finds squash again, you're going to have more problems with borers the next year. But if you plant your squash in a completely different bed and you put something completely different in the squash bed, well, those larvae um, emerge, there's nothing to eat, and they're going to die, or at least their population is going to be greatly diminished. In those situations, you want to rotate. If you're growing tomatoes in a bed and you have a particular tomato disease that happens, again, the spores and the bacteria that cause that tomato disease is going to be in that soil. So you want to rotate out tomatoes from that bed. And when we rotate to another bed, it should be at least three years before you put the, the plants back into a bed where you know that there's a pest or a disease problem. So most of the time, I don't rotate my crops unless I know I have a specific problem. Nikolai is saying, I have a layer of wood chips on all my beds. All the beds have done well, but my first one needs to be amended with compost. What would you suggest I do with the wood chips? Um, just rake them to the side, just move them off. Um, that's what I do. I'll have um, beds, and some of my beds actually, you know, have five or six inches of wood chips as I'm trying to improve the soil because I haven't planted in them yet. With the deep wood chips, that's what I do. Um, when I put in some of my 
um, aronia bushes and some of my current bushes in a bed like that. I raked away the wood chips and then planted the plants. And then I moved some of the wood chips back over um, those plants. You do the same thing when you're amending with compost. You move the wood chips out of the way, you amend the soil, and then you move the wood chips back over um, the amended soil. So it's a little bit extra effort, but that's what's usually necessary. I don't encourage that you, you, you dig in the wood chips or you amend with wood chips into the soil. You know, kind of like I talked a little bit about earlier, putting the wood chips in a compost pile. It takes a lot of nitrogen. It's going to rob some of the nutrients of the soil and before it decomposes. So try not to get the wood chips in the soil, but you have the right idea. Amend with the compost. Just move them out of the way. Once you've amended, move them right back. And that should be a good way to do it. Um, so Mayra saying, sorry to log in late. No problem. You can always watch what you missed in the replay. Um, good morning to you as well. How do you know when pumpkins are ready to harvest? So there's a couple ways that you can know pumpkins are ready. Um, the first is to look at the stem. So the stem going to a pumpkin, and this holds true for, for other winter squashes as well. You should see a color change in the stem where it'll actually start turning brown. It'll go from a nice healthy green color when everything is growing and, and getting bigger. And then when the pumpkin is reaching maturity, you'll notice that the stem is changing color. It's actually getting harder as well. So look for that color change. Another way is to look at the color, especially with pumpkins. It should be a nice, rich orange or yellow, depending on what, or white even, depending on what kind of pumpkin you're growing. All pumpkins are gonna be green and then gradually change to the color uh, of pumpkin that you're growing. When it reaches maturity, it should have that color all the way around it. So look for that color. Uh, look for the, um, the skin to harden. And so I mentioned this before uh, a couple weeks ago when I was talking about one way to check these winter squashes and when they're, they're ripe and ready to harvest. The young plant will have a soft skin. That outer shell will be soft. And if you take your thumb and your thumbnail and just press your thumbnail gently into that outer shell, if it's still green, you're going to leave an indentation. Your thumbnail will leave an indentation. But when it's mature, just like the stem is going to harden, well, that outer shell is going to harden as well. So if you push your thumbnail into the outer shell of your pumpkin, you should get resistance. It, it shouldn't leave a, a deep impression or indentation in the plant. So those are the things that I use to determine when my pumpkins are ready. Um, go ahead and go out there and experiment and see what you find. Is the color good? Has that stem going into the, the pumpkin change color? And do you get resistance when you push your thumbnail into it? Those are, those are the ways I do it. Um, Carpe diem Jonah. Is there a safe way to ferment a vegetable without using salt? Uh, not really. You can um, see people out there that are suggesting other ways to do it. But the, the thing about fermentation is it's the lactobacillus bacteria that's causing the food to ferment. And it's basically a three-stage process. So the salt, that brine, or you spread and mix the salt in cabbage, like if you're making a sauerkraut, the salt is actually killing some of the bad bacteria and creating an environment where the bad bacteria just won't survive. And so that salty environment is necessary to start getting rid of the bad bacteria. And once that bad bacteria is gone, now other bacteria start um, growing and they're competing with each other for dominance. Well, the lactobacillus bacteria thrives in that salty environment. And so the bad bacteria is dead the good bacteria now starts growing and the lactobacillus bacteria, as it grows, one of the things that it produces is lactic acid. And it's the lactic acid that ferments food. 
So unless you can create an environment for the lactobacillus bacteria to grow and create the lactic acid, then you're not going to get the fermented foods that we're used to. It's possible to do it in an environment without salt, but you have to figure out a way to kill the bad bacteria and to really get the lactobacillus growing and creating that lactic acid. And I, I don't think it's something most of us can really do in our kitchen. And that's why the way we do fermentation is with a salty brine. So you can look into it more and you can find, you know, some university research that, that will grow the lactobacillus in an environment that's not salty. But for the, for the rest of us, just use a brine, ferment that way, and you're much more likely to have success. <clears throat> Okay, Denise is saying, I bought potting soil that contains peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, and worm castings. Is it okay to use in my pots and my indoor water grow tent? Um, and so it, it sounds like because you've got the SIP pots, um, you need a mix like that that has good drainage, but it also will absorb water. Um, you, you didn't purchase a potting mix. Um, that's okay. The soil sounds like uh, it's a, a soilless mix, and all of those ingredients look really good. So um, I think it will probably work fine in your winter grow tent. Go ahead and try using it um, and see what your results are. Uh, I, I really don't see anything in there that is detrimental, and it's probably one of those things that you'll have some good success with. So um, try it and see how it works out, and then let us all know about it. Okay, okay. Um, let's see. It uh, looks like um, I answered the question. Carpe Diem is, has answered a number of times. So I'll just go ahead and move now to the rapid response questions from last week. These are 15 questions that I get, didn't get to, and I'll get to them now. Melinda Miller said, The deer have just started jumping the fence to my garden. They're eating the leaves and leaving the beans. Will this hurt the productivity of the beans? So anytime you have a pest be it an insect pest or an animal pest, and they're eating the leaves of your plant, a lot of it depends on how much is eaten. So a leaf here or two, or a leaf or two here or there, you're probably not gonna see much problem with the production on your plant. But particularly with deer, if they strip your plant of leaves or they eat a lot of the leaves, then yes, you're probably going to see a loss of production because the leaves just aren't there with the photosynthesis that's necessary for the plant to grow and necessary to send energy to the beans or whatever the fruit might be. So uh, don't be too worried about pests, but when you see that a lot of the leaves have been eaten or destroyed or falling off, then you're probably going to lose production. You might even consider pulling the plant at that point and using that space to grow something else. Joe Taffer is saying, I was told that using high nitrogen fertilizer such as blood meal will lower soil pH. How true is this? Yes. Um, a lot of those, those um, different organic fertilizers will affect pH. So the blood meal will lower pH, the bone meal will raise pH, but it's usually not enough to really see a big difference because you shouldn't be using that much bone meal, that much blood meal. Um, if you're using a lot of it, then you're over fertilizing. So the amount that you're using is probably not enough to really change the soil pH in any noticeable way. And once the nutrients have been um, absorbed from whatever that material is, the soil is going to return back to a, a, a typically balanced state. So even if it does affect pH, it's just going to be temporary. Arena Kim, we were talking a lot about corn last week. Do the birds eat the kernels? I'm growing corn but haven't noticed birds yet. Um, for those of you of a certain age, remember watching the Heckle and Jekyll cartoons with the blackbirds eating the corn? Birds will eat corn, especially blackbirds. But the thing about corn, and this holds true for just about every fruit that you're going to grow that a bird might eat, the birds aren't going to eat it until it's ripe, until it's ready to eat. So probably the reason you haven't seen birds eating corn is because the corn's not ripe yet. It's not ready to be harvested. But you need to keep an eye on it. If you've got birds and you know them to eat your crops, 
you might want to harvest a little bit early, a little bit before the plant or the fruit is fully ripe because the birds know. Those of you that have been listening to me for a while and watching my videos know I've shared this before. I've had plants, grapes, um, different types of fruits that I was growing like um, um, apples and peaches. And if you wait too long, the birds are going to get to them on the day that you were planning to harvest because you know when it's ripe, well, they know when it's ripe too. So if you don't have the bird problem yet, but sus suspect it, go ahead and harvest a little bit early before the birds get to it. Um, S. Muhammad 216 is mint invasive. It seems as though it has invaded a lot of areas in my garden. And there were a couple of you that responded to this last week. Thank you for that. Yes. For those of you that weren't, last, weren't here last week, mint is incredibly invasive. It will take over a garden. So if you want to grow mint, grow it in a closed container. In my garden, I'm using one of my cattle troughs, one of those livestock tanks for my mint. It is fully enclosed on all sides and the bottom with metal so that the mint can't escape. If you let it escape, it will take over. I'm actually letting my mint flower right now for a video so I can show what mint looks like when it flowers, but I'm gonna start cutting off all those flowers before they turn into full seed because I don't want the mint escaping my garden. It can take over. Painting Tracy, should I be pruning off runners off the first year bare root strawberries? Um, yes, uh, I, I have first year bare root strawberries and I did a video about this uh, last week as well. And I prune off the runners on the first year plants. Towards the end of the season, after the plants have grown nice and strong, because that's why I'm pruning off the runners, is so the plants can grow nice and strong. I will let one or two runners grow just to fill in some of the space around the plants. So that next year, the first year plants become second year plants. And some of those runners that are young this year are essentially first year plants next year. And so that's one way I fill in my strawberry bed. I don't let all the runners um, develop when the plants are young and still developing their root system. But once they're established, even in the first year, I do let some of the runners grow. Rick Short asks, what makes your tomato skins tough? For the most part, if you've got tomatoes and the skin is thick or the skin is tough, it's probably the variety of the tomato that you're growing. And that's one reason why you don't see some of the heirloom varieties being sold in stores, because some of the heirloom varieties have really tough skin. That's the most likely reason. It could also be environmental. And so, like me, if you have an environment that's really windy, really hot, and really dry, then some of the tomatoes can develop a tough skin. It can actually get sunburned, and sunburned tomato skin is actually pretty tough. Um, or if you're underwatering, if the plants are really stressed, it might develop a tough skin. But if you're doing everything right and the weather is consistent and you still have tough skins, it's probably the variety of the plant. Arena well, Kim last week had asked, is it true cat-faced tomatoes are too much trouble to eat to be worth it? I wouldn't say it's too much trouble. So a cat-faced tomato develops because it wasn't completely pollinated. There might have been an issue as the blossom was developing. And so the, the tomato grows, but it wasn't completely pollinated. Now it gets this really gnarly looking base. It's called cat face. And so what happens is because it looks kind of gnarly and it's got all these folds in it, um, people think that there's a problem. And as Arena's asking, is it worth it? It's still completely edible. There's nothing wrong with eating a cat-faced tomato. It just doesn't look normal. So is it worth the effort? Well, I've had years where I didn't have a lot of fruit on the plant and the plant had a couple cat-faced tomatoes. That told me that when that plant was setting flowers and those flowers were getting pollinated, maybe I had some really cold weather or maybe there was some issue with the pollinators. So if the only fruit I can get on a plant is a cat face one, I'll eat it. 
I don't think it's too much trouble at all. Uh, Anita Murphy had asked, we are on several acres, have lots of forest floor leaf litter, not raked for years. Can I rake it up and use it as mulch in the garden before new leaves fall? Absolutely. In fact, some of that, that forest litter has already started to decompose. And so essentially you're adding uh, compost, a chunky, rich compost as a mulch, which is great for your garden. So I definitely encourage that you rake up some of that, that leaf litter in the foresty or treed area and use that as mulch in your garden. I really like to use it, getting back to that earlier question, as a way to winterize my beds. So if I can fi find some partially decomposed leaves going into the winter, I throw those in a thick layer on my garden beds. Um, it's really, really good if you can find it. SCS Angler, greetings from Michigan, zone six. Is it too late to plant a fall crop? Suggestions on what might work best. So I've got a handful of videos that I've been releasing over the last couple weeks about fall gardens. It's not too late. And the one that I just released last night about doing a fall garden in containers. If you haven't been able to prepare some of your raised beds or in-ground beds yet for a fall garden, but you're worried that you don't have enough time because cold weather's coming, consider doing a fall garden in a container because you can move those containers to take advantage of the sun, move them into sheltered areas when the cold weather threatens, um, it's not too late. So go ahead and review that video that I released last night if you haven't seen it, if you're interested in fall plantings and um, haven't got to it yet. And I also talk about um, what plants to do in those videos as well. Wendy W, do you have a compost video or do you plan to create one? Yes, I do have a compost video and I plan on doing more. So go ahead and look in my library for understanding compost and look for more videos to come. Barb Hollinger, do you plant many microgreens? I do not. Um, microgreens are a great option. There's a lot of stuff, and this is a bit ironic. There's a lot of stuff I don't do in my garden because I just don't have the time to do it in my garden. I'm doing three videos a week. I'm doing this live stream. There's a lot that I do in my garden because I want to do a video about it. And microgreens take enough um, time and energy to do it right that it would take away from some of the other things that I'm doing in my garden. So as we move into the winter, I'm hoping to do some microgreens under lights. And when I do that, I'll, I'll make a video about it, release the video. But I'm not doing it right now just because I don't have the time. But it, it is something I encourage you all to do. Um, Susan Voorhees, do you plant using the moon calendar or farmer's almanac, etc.? Um, no, I don't. And this gets back to what I talked about earlier as well, where you get to understand your own weather patterns and your own climate. And so I have a relatively short growing season. And a lot of the moon calendar, a lot of the farmer's almanac, a lot of the biodynamic gardening methods, They'll tell you to plant on a particular date or plant when the moon is full or whatever the particular guidance is. Well, in my region, if I wait for some of those specific times, I might lose out on a great window of opportunity. And if I lose two weeks on the front or th three weeks on the front because I'm trying to plant according to somebody's suggestion that lives thousands of miles away from me, well, that's not suitable for me in my garden. So I plant based on what my region has historically demonstrated to be most effective. And a lot of that is old wives' tales, or, or I should say old gardeners' tales. So if you have a lot of gardeners in your area that tell you when the best time to do something is, listen to them. In my area, the old gardener's tale is you don't plant tomatoes before Memorial Day. It's very accurate. The end of May, beginning of June in my area is about the soonest that we can plant tomatoes and expect them to survive a late frost. But a moon calendar might tell me to plant in the middle of May, or the farmer's almanac might tell me to plant in the middle of May. Well, I've learned 
you don't plant tomatoes in my region before the end of May. So, no, I don't follow any of those gut guidelines because they just don't work for my region. I encourage you to learn what works best for you in your region and your garden. If it coincides with the moon calendar, the farmer's almanac, great. But there's no guarantee that it will. Lucky Gardens, can we start borage now in zone 5B? Absolutely. Borage um, is a great plant to put in the ground for a fall garden. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, check out the videos to get some guidelines as to how to grow and maybe some extra protection you might need, um, but especially in, in zone 7B. I'm in zone 5B, and it's still not too late to put borage in the ground. Will Rusher, I have vine borers in my zucchini. How do I keep them from moving to my pumpkin patch? And so if you have a particular pest, especially a squash borer of some type, get rid of the plant. Just remove it. The plant is going to die. You, the, any fruit that on it really isn't going to develop much further. And those insects will continue to grow, lay eggs, and spread to other beds where they'll lay their eggs for next year. You might not have a problem with the borers in your pumpkins or other squashes this year because most of the damage comes from the larva, but just remove those plants so it doesn't spread into any other beds for next year's potential problems. And Lena Abbey had said, I want to attract some mantis. Not sure what to plant. They are solely carnivorous. So, uh, yes, the, the praying mantids are carnivorous. They're not going to eat plants. They're going to eat insects. So one of the ways to encourage the mantids in your garden is to encourage all insects in your garden. And the way you encourage insects coming to your garden, particularly the beneficial insects, is you provide them shelter and water and food. So I put in a water feature this year. I'll be doing more water features to get more water in my garden. I've got flowers, I've got grasses, I let the weeds grow to encourage the insects in my garden. And then I leave wood piles and other sheltered areas where insects might overwinter. Now the mantids, a praying mantis, likes to overwinter, likes to have that shelter in a shrub, believe it or not. So they actually like those hardier bushes. If you want to encourage mantids in your garden, have shrubs in your garden and then have that water and they're going to find their own food through the other insects. It's incredible how a lot of these predators will find your garden without you really taking much effort other than just growing a lot of plants and not using insecticides. So there you have it, a way to encourage the praying mantis in your garden in addition to all the other rapid response questions from last week. Uh, I'll do the same thing next week. Lots of things pop up that I can't get to. And if you've been asking questions, um, keep asking the questions by all means. But I'll review them over the course of this next week. And I'll pick 15 of the top questions that were asked this week. And I'll answer next week. Uh, Guanto R is saying, how do I attract bees? Um, so bees are pollinators primarily. But what bees are doing in your garden is they're finding the flowers and they take the pollen back to their hive um, if they're a honeybee. If they are one of the other um, solitary types of bees, uh, and you can see my, my video about um, building a bee hotel uh, where I talk much more in depth about this, but a lot of those solitary bees will be eating the pollen or taking the pollen back to their nest, back to the hole for their eggs. Either way, to attract bees to your garden, you have to have flowers. You have to have flowers that are producing pollen. Now, naturally, all of the plants we're growing for the most part will develop flowers at some point. So your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your squashes, they're all going to have flower flowers before they fruit. That will attract some bees. But if you want to attract more bees, then you want to start growing flowers in general. Flowers of all different types with no purpose other than to attract the bees. 
and I'll be doing that in my garden for this next year. I'll definitely show you in the course of videos, of, uh, of course, that's to be expected, uh, but just keep planting flowers. Flowers, 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 and some water, and you'll have bees. It's, it's that simple. So Motorsport NEJ, do you have any plans for a low tunnel growing guide? I'm curious about timing and selection for a low tunnel. Um, so yeah, actually the very first video I ever did many years ago um, was a low tunnel system. Uh, you can go back and look at it. It doesn't have as much information as my newer videos have, so I am planning on redoing it. I've got a video from about this time last year where I talk about using low tunnels to extend your growing season. So definitely in the plan, you will see more videos about low tunnel growing. And uh, right now I don't have a particular guide in the form of a video, but they're coming. And, and I mention low tunnels and hoops and high tunnels in various videos that I've done. So go back to my library and you might see a video might, that will interest you and answer some of your questions, but there's definitely more coming. Okay, um, good, lots of information passing back and forth. M. Markle, Heidi, um, Laura Full, all talking about the mantis. Um, they're such a cool insect. And, and they're one of my favorites, um, especially at the Galileo Garden. I had a number of the mantids. But what was so incredible is in the dry grasses that were brown, I would find brown praying mantids. And in the plants that were green, I would find green praying mantids. And I, I, that just, insects are just so incredible to me. And especially that type of insect where they will find your garden, but not only will they find your garden, but they're so well camouflaged that the ones you get will match the color of your plants. And it just blows my mind the way the insect world works. And that's why I say grow everything. Grow flowers of all types. Grow grasses of all types. Grow shrubs. Leave the piles of broken branches. All that stuff is going to attract insects and they will attract the insects that match up with all those flowers and all those plants and all those grasses. And when you have that really huge, healthy environment, um, then you've got just an incredible opportunity for your garden to get better. So Sharon, cool to you too. Thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate it. Um, the picture is not of someone that looks like Sharon. So I'm guessing that is someone in your family. But thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so um, I love all this conversation going back and forth about the, the mantids and the insects and all the rest of it to include the tomato hornworms. I, I luckily don't have any tomato hornworms yet. I keep looking. My neighbor has chickens and I'm just waiting to find that tomato hornworm and then throw it over to the chickens. If you've never fed a hornworm to chickens, you're missing out on one of the great adventures of life because it's, it's remarkable to see how the chickens respond to a big, fat hornworm. Uh, so if you have chickens nearby and you have hornworms, pluck them off, throw them to the chickens. It's, it's really exciting. It's better than watching TV. So let's talk a little bit today. It's philosophy time. And so um, as I look at the garden and as I think about what I'm going to, sh to share with you each week, I tried to develop a message that I think is worthwhile. And as I was thinking about what I would share with you this week, I thought, let's talk about sharing. When we were growing up, if you have siblings, chances are the people that raised you tried to teach you about sharing because you had to share with your brother, you had to share with your sister. If you were in school, the teacher probably taught you about sharing. It's just one of those life lessons that we learn. Some of us are better at it than others, but we all know about sharing. Well, I think gardening is the perfect opportunity for you to develop sharing. If you share already and you are a gardener, well, by being a gardener, you have the opportunity to share everything about gardening. Not only your 
wealth of information with those of you, those people that you know that don't have as much information as you, even if you're a first year gardener, share your experiences with someone else. Share what you've learned. Share your knowledge. And that just helps grow more gardeners. If you are out there in the garden and you see something that you've never seen before, well, share it with other gardeners who maybe haven't seen that before. I talked about that last week and, and some of you shared a lot of the new things that you had seen in your garden, which is fantastic. Well, if you see something new in your garden, you share it with another gardener and the lesson that you've learned from seeing whatever it is, well, now that new gardener can already think about it so that when they encounter that same situation, they're prepared, they're ready, and you helped a gardener in the future. You can also share the garden. I've been doing that this week. The zucchini, the squash, the beets, the turnips, the carrots, all the stuff I was harvesting this week, I shared almost all of it. I shared it with family, I shared it with friends, I shared it with neighbors. And I, I was so happy at the end of the day to have that sense of accomplishment that I was able to help somebody else make their world a little bit better, make their menu a little healthier with what I shared with them. And I did not at all worry that, oh man, I didn't get to eat that delicious looking zucchini. I wish I would have kept it. No, not at all. I felt glad that I was able to share a zucchini with someone who probably enjoyed it much more than I would have. Because if you're gardening and you're harvesting, after a while, there's only so much you can do with a zucchini. I shared some of my recipe ideas at the beginning of this live stream, but after a while, zucchini and squash is just zucchini and squash and you get tired of it. Well, the other people that don't have access to this fresh vegetable, they're definitely going to enjoy it more than you do. So share it. Don't get tired of it. Don't leave the zucchini on the vine because you just don't want to harvest. Share it. Harvest. Let others enjoy it. Share the experience of gardening with everybody around you. Now you'll see this. I've got a video coming up next week. Well, I, I'll talk more about this philosophy about gardening, but especially right now, as we get to the end of our season in, in many places, especially for you new gardeners, well, it's really easy to just brush off your dirty pants and say, okay, I'm done for the season. Boy, that was fun. And then walk away and wait till next year. Well, I say don't wait. Over the course of the next five or six or seven or eight months until you get to next spring and you put in a new garden, over the course of the winter, you can still share your garden without having to harvest a zucchini or a tomato or a cucumber. Instead, share your experience. Now, think about the holidays that are coming up. So often during the holidays when families get together, you all talk about the same stuff, and every year it's the same thing. It might be football. This year it's probably going to be the virus. But instead, infuse a little bit of gardening in your family gatherings. Share your gardening stories. Share your gardening experiences with non-gardeners. And if they can see how excited you are about gardening and how excited you were about the six batches of pickles that you made, well, that might be intriguing enough. It might be just enough enticement. You might be planting that figurative seed in their brain so that next year, maybe they'll start gardening too. Or if you are sharing stories as a first year gardener, and you are talking about how much you're looking forward to your second year, well, maybe you'll have someone to help you in that second year because they see how excited you are and they go, well, hey, when you build that new bed or when you put those plants in, 
Give me a call. I'll help. Well, you might never get that help in your garden if you didn't share that experience in the first place. And, and I've got guys lined up that I've shared my needs for the garden. I'm going to be planting a lot more next year. Well, I need new beds. And I'm going to be building some structures in my garden. Well, I shared that need. And I had friends say, hey, give me a call when you want to do that. It's all about sharing. It's sharing what you have, what you don't have, what you've done, what you have yet to do. Just talk about gardening at every opportunity. Don't be that, you know, old grizzled gardener who has the same stories you've been telling for 40 years. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying share the newness of gardening and share what's happening right now in your garden. And if you do that, the end of the day you can just sit back and know that you've helped spread the word a little bit helped improve other people's lives and it really takes no effort at all it is so easy to do that it's incredible and don't be surprised if the people that you share with start sharing back that's incredible my neighbor the one i mentioned i'm going to give hornworms to their chickens he walked up to me, I was filming a couple days ago, and he had a chicken egg. Now his chickens have just started laying eggs to the point that it's maybe only a week or two of eggs that they've had. And they only had one chicken laying eggs. So put yourself in his shoes. You're raising chickens. They just started to lay eggs. Most people would covet those eggs and eat every single one. What did he do? He came over and gave me one of his eggs, one of the very first eggs he had. It made my day, it made my week, and now it makes me want to share more with him. So that's the way to make a world, the world, a better place. If you share with someone and they share with you, or even if they don't share back with you, maybe they share with someone else, we all get better as a result of it. So gardening, almost by definition, how we garden is so suited for sharing that you almost have to try not to do it. Well, I say don't even put that in your mind. Instead, try to figure out how you can do it and how you can do it more often and how you can do it more effectively and how you can enjoy that entire process. So there's some words of philosophy for the week. I hope you take them with you make your world a little bit better and make all of the world a little bit better. That's how I approach gardening. That's how I look at it. And I enjoy sharing all of my time, all of my efforts, all of my videos with you in the effort to make you a better gardener. You know that. I repeat that often because I really believe it. And I hope you can continue moving that forward with the other people in your life. That brings us to the end of our time together. Prepper Chris, thank you so much for that contribution. I'll go ahead and answer that question next week about growing hemp. And I was thinking about it this morning, as a matter of fact, as to a, a video I may be doing this winter. So I'll get to you, Chris, next week. To all of you, I hope you have a great gardening week. I hope you get everything you're looking for and more. And I hope that I've helped you this week become a better gardener just a little bit. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.